So thank you very much for all of you for being here today and helping us raise awareness to the number one killer of women in the world, which is cardiovascular disease. I'm here with my good friend, Nadia Lapa, and we're going to start uh, by telling our stories together because Nadia and I are very, very similar. We have a lot of similarities. We have the same age. We have thriving careers. And up to a certain point, our lives were the same, and then they became quite different. And that's what we're going to tell you today. Uh, and Nadia is going to tell, her, tell you her experience uh, through cardiovascular disease and how she has overcome it. And after this, I will give you a slightly more technical talk about cardiovascular disease in women that we hope that you will take it with you, share with your colleagues, and apply to the care that you provide to your patients. So without further ado, let me tell you a tale of two months. Nadia, I'll have you start. So, he's really cute, eh? Um, so this is Master Nicholas. This is my uh, little bundle who came into this world. I think there's a little bit of feedback. Uh, came into this world February 24th, 2016. Um, he has two older siblings and two loving parents. And then just a few weeks after Nicholas was born, uh, this is uh, my son, Luca, on April 3rd, 2016. Uh, I welcome him into the world. Nadia and I didn't know each other at the time. Uh, but just a few weeks apart, we had two healthy, amazing little boys. And then, like I said, up to that point, we have very, very similar stories. Same age, career women, young families, you know, struggling with parenthood. Yes. In fact, uh, seven weeks after this, this is what I was struggling with. I was struggling, <laughs> this is the truth, this is not staged, I was struggling with literally staying awake and you know, having to, to manage this new aspect of my life that it was brand new to me. He is my first and only son. However, at the same time that I was dealing with this very superficial struggle, Nadia had different struggles that she had to deal with. Nadia. I, don't, I don't know that it was a superficial struggle that Thais had to deal with. I think. All new moms or new parents deal with uh, sleepless nights, a lot of Netflix, and crying newborns. And so I sympathize with that picture, and I think if I looked hard enough, I'd probably find one as well. Um, but something very different happened to me when uh, Nicholas was seven weeks old to the day, and that was that I found myself uh, upstairs in the C or in the heart of in, I was going to say in the CCU, but I don't know that I was right there just, just at that time. But I was here. And that's not where I thought I would be seven weeks after delivery. And I'm sure most of you, as if you can think back to when you were new parents, um, you wouldn't have imagined that for yourselves either. Um, I don't remember what's on the next slide. Okay. So I'm going to go into a little bit of my history right now and my story and tell you a little bit about how I came to be here. So as Thais mentioned, um, at seven weeks, I found myself here, I found myself upstairs. And that day started out to be a very typical, a very normal day, pretty much what any mom, new mom would do. That day I decided, well it was pre-planned I guess, that I would go into the office and that I would share uh, my new little bundle of joy and show them off to my colleagues. And I think most new moms do that, about the seven or eight week mark, right? And you're proud and you're excited and you get them all dressed up in their finest clothes, you actually take the time to take a shower and <laughs> shave your legs, thank God, and to do all the wonderful things that you probably haven't done in seven weeks. So I did just that, and we met, and we had a beautiful lunch with uh, some very close friends that were also colleagues. And then we went to my tower. I worked downtown. Uh, I'm an engineer with Transport Canada, and I visited with my, uh, with my group. But the minute that I landed in the um, commission airspace to sign in, I started to feel an overwhelming anxiety, the need to like run, to flee, to hide, to just be away from people. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced that, but it's a very uncomfortable feeling. The feeling that something was wrong, but honestly, I had no idea. I proceeded to go back upstairs to try to like figure out what was happening. I started to feel pressure in my chest. I was nursing, so I thought maybe the baby was due for a feed. Maybe I was developing mastitis that quickly cleared my mind because it was obvious that that's not what was going on. I became very violently ill in the washroom. But even as I was laying on the cold, dirty washroom floor in a public building with my colleagues telling me, you know, something's going on, something's not right, we're going to call for help, I was, I did what most people, most women would do. I belittled it. I said, no, just wait, give me a second, it'll pass. I was sick, I'm going to start to feel better. It's all going to go away. 
it didn't go away. Thankfully, they knew more than I knew what was going on, and they called for help. They called 911. The paramedics came, they triaged me, they saw something they didn't like, and I was whisked away very quickly with the sirens blaring, which I thought was overkill at the time. Um, and I bypassed all the normal uh, triage routines of the Ottawa Hospital ERs and was brought immediately to uh, the cath lab downstairs. Now, I don't know if it's normal to not remember stuff. I don't remember much. I do remember, though, something very significant. You guys, well, I don't know if it was you guys, maybe there was someone here, um, kept asking me, you know, um, I guess this repertoire of questions that you're, you're told to ask or that you're supposed to ask to try to discern what the problem is. So in these questions that they were asking me, I just kept saying, no. Are you a smoker? No. Do you do recreational drugs? No. Do you have a family history of heart disease or heart ailments or anything? No. Are you diabetic? No. And it was just no, 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 no. And I could tell they were getting frustrated, maybe trying to figure out what I was doing here because obviously I needed to be there. And they kept saying this word SCAD. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, I felt like an idiot who didn't understand the language that the doctors were speaking amongst themselves. They weren't talking to me, obviously. And afterwards, it became a little bit more apparent. But um, I just remember that feeling that like, I did nothing wrong. Like, what am I doing here? And even as I'm downstairs in your cath lab, and I don't remember any of the, the procedure. I don't know what happened. Again, I don't know if that's normal, but that's what happened to me. Um, I, I just kept thinking, like, why? Like, is this just bad luck? Like, what, what, what is happening? What are they doing? What are they looking for? So anyways, after two heart caths, they came up with a very plausible solution for the amount of pain that I was feeling, which was that I had suffered a heart attack and that two of my coronary arteries, maybe something else, but two of my coronary arteries had torn. So my LAD and my RCA. The LAD they left to heal on its own because it was only 60% blocked, and I guess that's what the, uh, the procedure is. Um, but the LAD was 100% blocked. The RCA. Which one? The RCA. Oh, I did it backwards. You're right. The RCA, <laughs> the RCA was 100% blocked, and so they obviously had to put in some stents to help me, uh, help me along. After they did that, it was all a very mechanical fix, and I'm sure Thais can speak more to, to all of the procedures and all that stuff that needs to be asked and answered. Um, I was recuperating upstairs, and again, I'm a civil engineer, so I'm like, okay, while well, they went in, they put some rebar reinforcement, and we're good to go. Like, it's all very mechanical, like, let's get on with life. We had haircuts scheduled that night. We had Taekwondo scheduled for the eldest. We had stuff to do, right? It's a busy house. So all that gets put on pause, and um, it didn't get better. Like, it just kept hurting, and it kept hurting more, and it kept hurting more. And I think I even asked, I'm ashamed to say this, but I asked one of the nurses, I said, you need to give me something because I've had three children, I know pain, and this is a different level of pain. Like, it was in my shoulders, I felt like someone was crushing my bones. Like, you know, you watch those, um, those cartoons with the characters, and they're pulverizing things, so that's what it felt like. Um, anyways, she said, we can't give you anything to knock you out. We're not allowed to do that. So uh, I suffered through it, and then it was very clear that I was going into heart failure. And thankfully, um, I had a great doctor, Dr. Chi, who I don't know if she's here, but no, I don't think so, um, and her heart failure team, who was able to restore my heartbeat and my rhythm and get me back to where I needed to be after a period of time in the CCU. So I credit everyone here for doing what they had to do to get me home eventually with, with my little munchkins. Um, the journey home was, was complicated because while all this was going on, the regular beats of my other life, um, they didn't stop, right? Like they kept going. And so thankfully I had a great support system, my mom, my sister, my husband, who kind of had to pick up the slack and do what they could to keep everything running relatively smoothly for these three kids who don't know any better and don't need to know more than what we're telling them at the time. Um, going home is also very difficult for someone like me who used to search for things to do and create volunteer projects that I probably shouldn't have done and you know try to fill her, her time with all these things and, and be the A-type personality that I was. 
and then to be brought to a point where you have to like program how many times you're going to climb the flight of stairs or okay if I get up now to go to the washroom then I won't have to go back downstairs to get cereal later so maybe I'll just do that now like it was the energy level that was required to recuperate was incredible and I know that they told me that here and and they told me what to expect and everything but going home and and actually dealing with the flight of stairs and dealing with you know children who want to hug you and climb on you and and all that stuff like and you actually have to stop because your brain says go and your body says no like stop you need to stop so that was hard and the psychological impact as well of suffering something like this so young um, I think that I don't think I was prepared I think that I I mean I knew it would take about a year to start to feel or get to the point where I would um, be at for the rest of my life at least that's what I was told and I think they were pretty accurate with that it maybe took a year and a half to get to get to a good point probably the point I am now which is three years out um, but only when my body started to feel better was my brain able to process the trauma that occurred and um, to the point where I couldn't I was starting to lose sight of the horizon at that point like I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't, um, I couldn't see how I was going to get over thinking about these things all day. Like I would replay things that the doctors had said and I re would replay things that the nurses were telling me and moments of the days leading up, trying to figure out a problem, trying to figure out something that, that, that why this happened. Like it's literally called spontaneous. And so for me, that makes no sense because I'm always trying, this is what I've been trained to do, I'm always looking for the solution, I'm always trying to figure out why something happens, why it doesn't work, why it does work. So that's a very difficult thing for a person to process. But anyways, here I am, um, we're three years out. Last year I met Thais because we decided, or I decided, and I think she simultaneously decided, that uh, we were going to run the 5K for the Heart Institute. So um, last May, I think we did it, and it was my first real, oh, yeah, there we are. So, yeah, so those are my kids, yeah, and my husband. And last year, this was, um, this was us at Here's the race. Nadia looking very happy, and me looking not so happy keeping up with her. No, 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 that's not how it went the whole time. Oh, it was, it no, was. No, no. Um, yeah, so we, we, did, uh, we did a great run and uh, the time was a little slow because of me, but this year I'm going to try to amp it up a little bit and, uh, and we'll do it again. And so for me it's really important now that I feel better I, and, and I look back at what happened, I really feel like um, it's my responsibility. Uh, to, to try to advocate for this, that you know, someone who's, I'm, I'm, I'm educated, I have a science background and yet I had no idea that this was happening to me, no idea as I lay on the cold washroom floor that this wasn't mastitis, this wasn't an anaphylactic, new anaphylactic uh, allergy maybe or whatever, that I was actually suffering from a heart ailment and a heart attack. So I think that if, and it's so cliche, but I'm going to say it anyways, I think that if someone like me can have this, someone who ate kale and who ate grapefruit and exercised mainly because she was vain, but it still counts. <laughs> so if some, someone like me can have this happen, any, it can happen to anyone. So, uh, you know, it's better, and I tell people this, and said it's better to waste six hours in the emergency room if you feel like something's not right than to go home and lie down, which is what I would have done, and have the unthinkable happen. So that's my message. Thank you. Nadia, I've said this to you before, you are an amazing woman. So Absolutely. here before you, you have a person who has taken this adverse experience and completely turned it on his head, right? So you know, despite, I cannot even imagine going through what Nadia went through, and I had a very easy postpartum period in comparison, uh, but she has taken this adverse experience and turned it on his head. She is now, she went from patient to leader. She's a leader in our Women at Heart Peer Support Program. She's incredibly knowledgeable about heart disease in women, and she's very committed to spreading this word. If anything you want done, you just call Nadia, she will make it happen, right? Okay. She, yeah, that is true. So she is so committed, she's engaged with so many activities locally and nationally to raise awareness and make sure we continue to save women's lives. So another round of applause for Nadia because she's amazing. Thank you so much. You're amazing. Oh my God, you're amazing. <laughs> That was great. Perfect. 
Oh, sorry, we forgot the lessons. Oh, we have lessons. Uh, that's right. We may, we may have not, talked not about have lessons. them. Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay. Risk factors. So for women. So for the women in the audience. Um, know your risk factors and do your best to manage them. So I touched on this. So, you know, if, if you're a smoker, if you're diabetic, if you have family heart um, disease issues, uh, issues that run in your family, know what they are, talk to your doctor about them. There might not be anything you can do to manage them, but there might be something, right? So, um, so know your risk factors and how to manage them. Signs and symptoms of a problem. So, um, and I touched on this as well, I had no idea and I stress this, like no idea. I was very naive, very ignorant in this, in this realm um, of what was happening. So um, I think, and this is a good time to plug this, um, the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre has prepared some little magnets that you can put on a fridge or on a cabinet. There they are at the back. They're on the doorway. And um, just to spread the word to your colleagues and friends about what the possible signs and symptoms are, that's not always a classic Hollywood heart attack that's going to it's going to present itself in that way um, and advocate for yourself so if it hurts if something's not right you tell someone you tell your physician your doctor the people in the ER whoever it is and give them all the information you have and let them that's what they're trained to do let them figure it out it could be nothing it could be a simple thing that you don't think is important but maybe it's going to trigger something to them like I had no idea that telling them that I had a baby was important but if I hadn't put that piece of information on the table like they wouldn't have maybe associated a SCAD to me right away so I think it's really important just because you don't think something significant someone else might understand that that's a risk factor for something uh, for healthcare providers okay so um, I work for, um, I'm working on, on the, uh, the Alliance with Thais and, and some other lovely ladies and um, we're developing a few little toolkits but um, we've had some discussions on this, on this topic um, to educate. So you all work in the field of cardiology and you're all very probably, this is all no old news what, we're, what I'm saying to you, right? But um, some of your colleagues in other healthcare professions who work with women in particular um, at the time when a woman's giving birth or preparing to give birth or even like pediatrics like we go in with our babies a lot in those first few months so sometimes that's the first line of of health care that a, a mom has like she's not always going to see her OB after she has a baby she goes once at six weeks and that's it right so um, sometimes if these doctors know what could happen in my case a SCAD uh, there's a whole, a whole bunch of other things that can happen obviously um, and they might see something or talk to a woman about that then maybe you can you can you can help right um, identify your patient's risk factors, so I think I talked a little bit about that, and listen to the patient. So don't dismiss the symptoms because they don't fit with the typical, and typically women have different uh, symptoms than a man does. Um, to, uh, speak to their concerns and fears, so take a collective approach. One thing that we talk a lot about is um, is the fact that uh, you know what goes on in a woman's head is just as important as what goes on in her heart in that it all sort of works together and sometimes you can get signs and signals um, based on what's going on in her head of what's actually going on in her body. So those are, those are a few notes to move forward in your day, your busy day. Thank you very much, Nadia. All right, thank you. And I have no disclosures. So I want you to look at this picture here for a few seconds and tell me what do you see? Okay, I'll have a show of hands in a moment. I'll have to look at this for a second. So how many of you in the audience look at this picture and see a young woman looking away? Most of you. How many of you see this picture and see an old woman looking down? Some of you. How many could see both? Half of the room. So for the ones of you who didn't see both, uh, if I tell you this is the hair and this is the face of the young woman, the nose and the eyelash, this is her jawline and the necklace. If you didn't see her before, do you see her now that I've pointed it out? And for the ones of you who didn't see the old woman, if I, find, if I point to you that this is her big nose here, this is her mouth, this is a pointy chin, and here is one eye and here's the other eye, and she's wearing a headscarf. Do you see the old woman now, now that I've pointed it out? 
So that's what our brain is trained to do. Our brain is trained to recognize patterns and attach to those patterns and, and take it for granted. So I, I show you this example because this is what happens when it comes to heart disease in women. Because all of us here who are healthcare providers, we have been trained to recognize the pattern of heart disease that has been described in men. So when we face a woman with heart disease that may not be exactly what we have learned about, we may have difficulty seeing it until, of course, somebody points it out. And that's why I wanted to bring to you today some of these aspects. So hopefully I will help you see uh, women uh, uh, and how they may present with cardiovascular disease. Hopefully that will help in your practice. So let's start with some facts here. So breast cancer is a woman's greatest heart uh, health threat. I say this because this is what the far majority of women in Canada and in the world believe. It is a myth, however, because the reality is that heart disease kills five times more women than breast cancer does on a global scale. And in fact, heart disease kills two times more women than all cancers combined, also throughout the world. Despite this, only 13% of Canadian women, this is science from our own group, uh, identifies heart disease as their greatest health threat. So what I always uh, um, used to, to uh, uh, illustrate this is if you don't know that you could be in a car accident, you're not going to put a seatbelt, right? So if these women do not know they are at risk, they may not be doing all of the things that they have to do to prevent heart disease. And 80% of the time we can prevent. So this uh, awareness at the level of the community is extremely low. And in fact, like I said earlier, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women in the world, affecting one in every three women. One in every three women will be impacted by heart disease in their lifetime. Despite these very sinister statistics, heart disease remains today in 2019 understudied, underdiagnosed, undertreated, and undersupported in women. This is not a joke, it is a true fact. In the 1950s, the only patient information that you could ever find designed for women for heart disease was a brochure about how to help your husband recover from his heart attack. That's all you could find. At that time, nobody knew women could have, nobody believed that women, <coughs> excuse me, could have heart disease as well. And as a result, we can imagine that this lack of understanding has led to significant delays over the years and decades in terms of science and care that we have provided for women. To this date, heart disease is still under-researched in women. When you look at clinical studies for cardiovascular disease, 75% of them have focused on men. So they have either only included men, or if they had women, there were very few women, so not enough power to make conclusions in women, or the results were not reported separately. So as of today, we apply to women the same science that we know works for men, and sometimes that works for women, but sometimes that does not. So that's still today something that we're fighting to improve the quality of cardiovascular research that is applied to women. And at the educational level, many of us here in this room are healthcare providers, and I can challenge you to think of a point in your school, whether there was medical school, nursing school, physiotherapy, or graduate, etc. Did you have at any point in time a dedicated part of your curriculum about the unique aspects of cardiovascular disease in women, which we now know about a lot more than we did then? We don't get this as part of our curriculum. So as a result, there is also a significant low level of awareness among healthcare providers that are caring for these women. So when you combine all of these problems, we have low levels of public awareness, low levels of provider awareness, low, uh, less evidence-based medicine for the research issues I mentioned, and lower quality and effectiveness of care because not always the care that we provide to women is as good as it could be had we known more about uh, researching women. And that all comes to a head with worse cares and outcomes for women throughout the years. So this is why we're here today, is to help uh, bridge some of those gaps. So let me start uh, with some sex differences about cardiovascular risk factors. Like I said earlier, 80% of the time we can prevent cardiovascular disease. So these are conventional risk factors. Everybody here in this room is well aware that blood pressure, smoking, and diabetes increase the risk of heart disease. But each one of these factors are actually more ominous for a woman than they are for a man. For example, high blood pressure. This is the number one cause for death and disability worldwide. There are more hypertensive women walking around in this planet today than there are hypertensive men. And if you have a man and a woman with hypertension, the woman will have a higher risk of heart attack, stroke, or death as a result of the hypertension. Diabetes increases the risk for both men and women. However, diabetes increases the risk of heart disease three to seven fold in women and only two to three fold in men. So important for both sexes, even more important for women. In fact, in, for women of reproductive age, 
uh, having diabetes negates the usual protection that we young women have against the typical forms of cardiovascular disease. Smoking is also a very important risk factor, and for young women who smoke, they have 60% greater risk of heart attack compared to young men who smoke. And of course, as we have recently discussed uh, as well, uh, women have more difficulty quitting smoking because of the reasons that they picked up smoking to begin with. Other conventional risk factors include physical inactivity. This is also more common in women than it is in men. And obesity increases the risk of heart disease by 64% in women compared to 46% in men. So all of these conventional risk factors are present. In fact, 90% of Canadian women have at least one cardiovascular risk factor. Uh, and they are more dangerous for women than they are for men. And then on top of that, we have female-specific risk factors. These are things that men would never be exposed to, but for a woman, it can significantly impact the future cardiovascular health. For example, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, uh, there's an increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease due to uh, hormonal mechanisms, insulin resistance, and other metabolic factors. Of course, a, a woman's risk of, uh, risk of heart disease increases significantly after menopause, but those that have early menopause before the age of 40 had 95% higher risk of future heart attack. The other very important female-specific risk factor uh, is what we call the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. This is high blood pressure during pregnancy uh, or preeclampsia or eclampsia. Once uh, the, the mother delivers the baby, these issues resolve, and most people, the women and their providers, believe that the syndrome is over. But for a number of women, they still remain at future risk for cardiovascular disease. So here I have a summary of the statistics for you from very, very robust, large meta-analysis studies. Uh, if a woman has had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, she's 370% more likely to have chronic hypertension, 81% more likely to have a stroke in the future, 50% more likely to have atrial fibrillation, for example, 400% more likely to have heart failure, 250% more likely to have coronary artery disease or a heart attack, 50% more likely to die, and 221% more likely to die from a heart cause. And in fact, this occurs early. The mean age or the average age at the first heart attack or stroke for a woman who has had preeclampsia is only 38 years old. So this is a significant female-specific heart, uh, heart risk factor that is not very talked about. And there are other what we call non-conventional risk factors. For example, inflammatory rheumatologic conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, these conditions increase the risk of a heart attack or stroke by 50%. And by definition, these conditions are much more common in women than in men. So if you see a person, men or women, with these conditions, you need to increase their calculated cardiovascular risk by 50%. So we have to, a lot to, th to think about when these risk factors. Importantly, none of the risk scores that we use in clinic to estimate no Framingham, Reynolds, et cetera, none of them inc incorporate these female-specific risk factors that are very important. The other important issue for women is breast cancer. Uh, women that survive, if a woman survives breast cancer and, and grows to be older, uh, heart disease is the number one killer of breast cancer survivors. Radi radiation therapy and chemotherapy can be toxic to the heart. Nowadays, radiation therapy protocols are much, more redu uh, much reduced in terms of the dose and, and the uh, width of the radiation. However, radiation can cause disease of the coronary arteries, the heart muscle, the pericardium, and the valves. Uh, all of the layers of the heart can be involved. And some of the main chemotherapy agents that are very efficacious in curing women from breast cancer actually cause uh, heart failure and cardiotoxicity. So they have to be on surveillance, and they may have to be withdrawn from their, their cancer-saving therapy because they have developed heart disease. So these are important risk factors for women. So now let's change gears a little bit to symptoms. And symptoms is something that we talk about a lot, and it's very important to understand the differences. Uh, it has been reported that early heart attack signs have been missed in, early, in up to 78% of women. Like Nadia was saying, sometimes you're having the symptoms, but you don't quite click on to the fact that you may be having a heart attack. Women have been very good in terms of recognizing what we call the Hollywood heart attack, which is you know, the chest clutching, severe heaviness and tightness in the middle of the chest. That I think uh, women and women will recognize very well. But the problem is the definition of what we call today typical angina was made based on studies that included only men. So typical angina is very typical for men and may or may not be typical for women. 
So what does the textbook say about what is a typical angina or typical heart attack pain? Is a heaviness or tightness behind the breastbone that may radiate to the jaw or to the left arm, and it's usually brought on by exertion or and relieved by, uh, by rest or nitroglycerin. That's kind of the typical angina that we talk about. But in real life, what we see, particularly in women, is that the chest pain may not be tightness or, or heaviness. It may be described as burning, sharp, or dull, or indigestion. I have heard this word indigestion so many times. For some reason, women choose the word indigestion to report the chest symptoms, even if it's not indigestion. I, if you allow me an anecdote, uh, I saw a woman uh, a couple years ago, she was in her 70s, no risk factors other than her age, uh, and she kept saying that she had indigestion, and then she would drink Mountain Dew, pass some air, and then that will relieve, and then she will go on. So everybody, she believed, the doctor believed that she had indigestion, it sounds like it. Then one day she had indigestion, she drank Mountain Dew, she passed air, didn't get better, in fact it kept getting worse, and she had a feeling that something was wrong, that anxiety that uh, uh, Nadia spoke, spoke about. So she called 911, and she was having a STEMI, her right coronary artery completely occluded. You know, we know she was having indigestion relieved by Mountain Dew. So this is something that we, I am always humbled by these women that I meet about how they're teaching me, you know, how to take care of them. And she was one of them. The other thing that can happen to women is pain just here in the epigastrium, not necessarily in the chest, uh, or sometimes just in the neck or just in the jaw or just in the arms. I also had a patient that had exertional jaw pain and kept going to, going to the dentist, and the dentist diagnosed her uh, with uh, heart disease, so I sent her for a stress test, in fact, or maybe to an internist who then sent for a stress test. Uh, in women, pain can occur more likely than in men due to emotional stress, and I couldn't stress this enough. I see this every week in my Women's Heart Health Clinic. Emotional stress is a significant trigger for heart symptoms in women, and it's usually, unfortunately, eventually gets attributed to underlying psychiatric disorders such as um, uh, depression or anxiety. So, uh, but it's something that is truly a trigger for them. Sometimes they can have just shortness of breath or just nausea, or just a profound feeling of exha uh, exhaustion or anxiety. So we have to be in tune with these things. They are, they are not like the textbook tells us they should be, but they are very, very common in women. And this is a more technical slide here to prove a point, because what we hear a lot in cardiology is, oh, women with heart attack don't have chest pain. And this is a, 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 um, a table that disproves that. It's an article from last year in Circulation. And if you, keep he, uh, if you look here at the overall, you will see that 87% of women with a heart attack have chest pain, as opposed to 89% of men. So equal amounts of men and women, equal numbers of men and women have chest pain. The difference between men and women is that the chest pain women may have a different characteristic, as I mentioned earlier. And if you look at the bottom here, women are more likely than men to have at least three or four additional symptoms on top of the chest pain. So they have chest pain and shortness of breath, dizziness, fatigue, and headache. Uh, so when they come with these very complex florid sim uh, syndromes, uh, sometimes that muddies the water or that dilutes the picture for the woman herself and for the clinician. And it makes it harder to focus on the diagnosis at hand. So uh, that's uh, the, one of the main differences between men and women. Like I mentioned earlier, women have different ischemic triggers. This is also from last year's circulation, uh, Go Red edition. They took 306 patients that had a heart attack in the past eight months, half of them women. Uh, and then they made a few observations. One, even though all the patients had a heart attack, women with a heart attack, heart attack had less severe coronary blockages compared to men, but they still had a heart attack. And they had similar rates of revascularization. But then what they did is they took all these patients and they did two types of stress tests. One was a conventional one with just um, exercise, shown here, and the other one they did a mental stress test. Basically, they tell these people to just impromptu get up and give a five minute talk on topic, I don't know, the Cold War, whatever. So it's enough to produce a little bit of anxiety in most of us, but you will agree that it's not any close to real life stressors, right? But it's just enough to cause a little bit of distress. So two observations here. One, even though both men and women had heart attack and how got, they got similar rates of revascularization, women were about three times more likely than men to still have residual ischemia or poor blood flow to the heart on conventional stress testing. Then if you look here at the mental stress test, you will also see that women were about three times more likely than men to develop ischemia or poor blood flow to the heart due to just a very simple mental stress exercise. 
So it's just to understand that women are three times more likely than men to have mental stress as a trigger for their symptoms. So we cannot ignore that. So now let's talk about, about uh, a little bit about mechanisms of coronary artery disease, because not all heart attacks are created equal, and that is a good example of that. Here's what the textbook heart attack looks like. It's a severe or even complete blockage of one or more of the epicardial large coronary arteries by atheromatous plaque or cholesterol plaque, shown here in this nice coronary angiogram. Everybody can see, even if you're not a clinician, you can see the severe narrowing of the artery here. This is your bread and butter conventional textbook heart attack. However, like I said, not all heart attacks are created equal. Heart attacks, or sometimes just chest pain, can occur with what we call apparently normal or only mildly abnormal coronary arteries. And this is twice more common in women than in men. It's called MINOCA, myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. So this person right here was having a heart attack and you see no blockages anywhere. So why does that happen? So in this study, they looked at, uh, it's a meta-analysis of MINOCA, which as I just uh, explained to you, versus people that had a heart attack because of conventional uh, plaque in the arteries. They found that MINOCA is not uncommon. It's 6 to 14% of all heart attacks. When you look at the coronaries, you don't see disease. They found that the characteristics of these patients were as follows. Patients with MINOCA were younger than patients that had conventional heart attacks. They were more likely to be women, in fact, twice more likely to be women, and they were less likely to have high cholesterol. So usually a younger, it's not particularly young, it's not, they're not in their 20s, but they're younger than the average age for, for uh, the conventional heart attack patients. So what are some of the mechanisms that may underlie this diagnosis of MINOCA, which is again, much more common in women? So to me, this is a landmark study. It was published by a group in New York a few years ago in circulation. They took 50 women with MINOCA, so they had documented heart attacks. They had either ECG changes and or uh, troponin abnormalities. They had a heart attack. And they went for the angiogram, but they had clean coronary arteries. Then they went on to actually put an intravascular ultrasound catheter inside the arteries and look at the arteries for the inside. And this is what I'm going to show you here. They found that 38% of these people with heart attack with completely normal coronary angiograms, they had evidence of plaque disruption. So this is what I'm going to show you here. If you look at this patient, if you look at this LED, uh, it's perfectly normal. You don't see any irregularities. So they did an IVAS right in the IVAS is intravascular ultrasound, right at the segment here with the arrow. And if you look at this picture, you will see the catheter in the middle, and you see this crescentic shaped plaque here on the corner, and there's a big chunk of plaque rupture in this plaque that is not obstructive and it's mild. The same is shown here. In this particular IVAS, again, normal coronaries, you see a tiny little bit of now, maybe just 10% obstructive plaque but with a big chunk of, uh, of a rupture. And same here. So you do the conventional angle, you just see the, the yellow in the middle, so big, but you're missing this plaque rupture. And here I just have one more picture to show you what a plaque looks like, which is shown here. Again, normal LED here. They did the IVUS. They see a small amount of plaque with a chunk, like a bite was taken out of it. That's a plaque erosion. So that's something that conventional testing won't, won't tell us. And many women have been sent home with, oh, it wasn't a heart attack based on those, uh, based on those scenarios. The other mechanism for MINOCA is what we call microvascular dysfunction. This is a study from this week in Jack. Um, and I brought this picture here because the coronary arterial circulation is much more complex than what we see on the angiogram. So if you do an angiogram, you're gonna see the vessels up to here, up to here, and up to here, but they continue to branch like a tree and they become these hair-like vessels that are invisible to the naked eye with conventional angiography. But you can imagine that if this is the 417 and you're going home, and this is wide open, but you take a side road to, and there's a cow on the road, you're not gonna get home either, right? So the microvasculature is just as important in delivering blood to the myocardium as the epicardial coronary arteries. And this is something that we do not have very good ways of testing for. So microvascular dysfunction has been shown as a mechanism of MINOCA, or INOCA, which is ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arteries, and ENOCA is uh, angina with non-obstructive coronary arteries. In this study published this week, 224 women 
with signs and symptoms of uh, ischemia, of coronary ischemia, 81% of them had minimal or no blockages on the con conventional angiogram whatsoever, pretty normal arteries, and they followed them for 9.7 years. So a few observations. One, even though these women had pretty pristine coronary arteries, they still had cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, etc. And if you actually look at the proportion of these events that occurred in women that have absolutely no plaque on the angiography whatsoever, they were the majority. So still a lot of these women uh, with pristine arteries are still having events. Then they did something called coronary micro uh, or vascular reactivity testing. So they inject a whole bunch of different substances and they see how the, the artery reacts to it because the artery should dilate based on the substances, but if they don't, they constrict instead. That is a sign of dysfunction of the endothelium and the microvascular, uh, microvasculature. So here in blue, you have the women that had normal coronary microvasculature. And in uh, red, we had the women that had abnormal microvascular function. And on the y-axis, you have event-free survival. So as you can see, the women that had microvascular dysfunction were more likely to have cardiovascular events, heart attack, stroke, or death. And this was also observed among the women that had no coronary disease on the angiogram whatsoever. So that's a, it's a complicated issue because we don't have great ways other than this very invasive, potentially risky test uh, to, to diagnose this. So I face this all the time in clinic and I end up treating them empirically for a lot of the times. It's a little bit of voodoo, I tell them, uh, but it works. The other important mechanism of coronary artery disease that is not in our textbooks is uh, what Nadia just described, which is SCAD. So SCAD is a separation of one out of the three layers of the arterial wall that occurs spontaneously. And it's important for us to highlight this because over 90% of SCAD patients are women. And they're usually younger women, typically described in their 30s and 40s. But nowadays, because we are getting smarter and smarter in diagnosing SCAD, the, the average age has gone up to 53 because the more clinicians are aware of this. But up to even just five or six years ago, uh, I'm sure that we were looking at angiograms and say, oh, skinny vessels, and often happen to you. And now we are seeing that some skinny vessels uh, were indeed uh, SCAD. So it's important to recognize this as an important uh, mechanism for heart disease in women. And in fact, it is the most common cause for heart attack in young women. So let's uh, wrap up with cur uh, coronary artery disease treatment and prognosis. Even though men and women with heart attack benefit just as much from coronary vascularization, stents, or surgery, despite this equal benefit, women are less likely to be referred for a coronary angiogram, they're less likely to receive revascularization surgically or percutaneously, despite adjusting for confounders. So many people will say, oh, that's because women are older when they come in, because they have more comorbidities. But when you adjust for all of these things, women are still not being referred for revascularization as much. So they're having subpar treatment as compared to men. And this is very recent, as you can see. And that results in uh, significant differences in survival. So here we have temporal trends from 1992 all the way to 20, uh, 2010. For men and women, mortality from heart attack, uh, three, 30 days after a heart attack. Two messages here. First of all, the trends have been going down for men and women. But on the top here, you have black and white women. And on the bottom, you have black and white men. So even though the trends are coming down in both sexes, Mortality, 30-day mortality after a heart attack is still higher for women than it is for men. The gaps continue to close, and we would like to see this very, very low for both sexes, but it's still, it's still a fact. And despite the fact that cardiac rehabilitation has significant benefits for mental health, physical health, and helps prevent another heart, uh, heart event by about 21%, women are 50% less likely than men to enroll in cardiac rehabilitation. And this is due to a number of factors that have very much to do with the social roles of women in society uh, and taking less care of themselves so they can take care of everybody else. But not only that, women are also being referred for cardiac rehab a lot less. So this is a meta-analysis, and I'll walk you through it. There's a lots of studies uh, on this topic. We have the line of one here. Anything to the left of the line of one favors men being referred for rehab. Anything to the right of the line of one favors women being referred to rehab. And as you can see, this is all to the left. And the composite estimate here is that women are about 32% less likely to be referred for rehab by their doctors. So they're being referred less, and even when they get referred, they don't show up. So very few women actually benefit from this very important therapy. 
So all of this to say, I'm going to wrap up with this message that, and I hope you will agree with me, that male and female patterns of heart disease are different. Any of you here who are clinicians, I uh, ask you and urge you to train your brain to recognize both patterns. Uh, we have, just like I showed you with the picture in the beginning, you have to train your brain, okay, this is typical, this is not the typical, but that could still be a heart attack, and open your mind. Like I said, I am constantly humbled by the women that I meet week after week. So train your brain to recognize it and be aware of implicit bias. There are tests people can take to understand where their own implicit bias may be in healthcare. Uh, and this is an important one to, to try to avoid. For all the ones of you here who are scientists, you need to make concerted efforts to include women in your research. If you're a basic scientist, include female animal models, female tissues, female cells. Only then we will be able to understand uh, the, the effects of anything we do for the cardiovascular health of women. If you're a scientist, always look for interactions with sex and gender for the analysis you're performing, and try to always report the results by sex, or at least mention that you've looked at it and you found no difference. But just by doing that, you're already advancing the science for women. And for all the women here in the audience, understand what your risk factors are and how you can manage them. Talk to your doctor. Understand what the symptoms could be, even if they're not the classic one. And like Nadia mentioned earlier, do not ever delay care if you're concerned. In my experience, very anecdotal, even though the symptoms may be, quote, indigestion, I find that a lot, a lot of women, they have a sense of something is not right. This is indigestion, but it's not indigestion. They feel it. They know something is wrong. And I tell them to, you know, if you are concerned, you look for medical attention, it's the best that they can do. It's better than delaying care or potentially losing life as a result of that. I'll finish here by reminding you that here in Ottawa, you can always count on our team at the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre. We have a number of activities on the research level, on educational level, awareness, community outreach, and clinical. So all of these aspects are being covered by the Women's Heart Health Centre. So feel free to engage with us, send us patients, and utilize this amazing resource that we have here at the Heart Institute. And I'll finish here by thanking you very much for your kind attention. If you want to know more, lots of resources here. This is our web page. We have our Twitter handles. We have the mailing list for the uh, Women's Heart Health Center. And if you learn anything today, if any of you wear, uh, use social media, you can tweet with the Her, Her Heart Matters and Wear Wear Canada, uh, which are the official tweets, uh, or Twitter uh, hashtags for today. So we can uh, keep all the information in one place. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. So. Yeah, a couple of minutes. Thank you very much.